Uh, what, I, uh, what I did was, uh, this morning when I was having coffee, uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. I was having breakfast and I was looking through things and suddenly I read some pretty alarming piece of news. Uh, the research from Nature, uh, published recently, told me that within four minutes of me speaking today, you would have already made up your mind whether the speech was going to be interesting or extremely dull. Uh, and I thought, oh my goodness. And then the second thing was that, uh, according to research, um, the talks that last longer than 11 minutes are far more likely to be rated as dull correctly. And that freaked me out because Derek has given me 20 minutes to speak, so that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't very good. Anyway, um, so what I've done is I've put the more statistical stuff first because that was um, going to help me give you the facts and then there's lots of photos about life as a medic in general, as a, someone working in mental health. And um, so uh, some ideas about what it feels like to work with um, mental illness, severe mental illness for decades and still try and retain a joie de vivre, shall we say, uh, that is so necessary if you're going to really help people and colleagues. Um, and by the way, I didn't have that talk, so it took me a bit longer to work out some things that I might have done earlier if I had thought about it when I was younger. Um, so, but just, just for now, the well-being survey that I um, wanted to present to you um, admittedly was sent to 30% of the consultant workforce and only 30% replied, so you know what that means if you are into statistics. But I think that what's clear is that some of these findings have been replicated in bigger, bigger studies. And uh, what we know is that many consultants felt that most of the time they are valued by patients and that um, and valued by colleagues and staff, and I think that's very good. I'm sorry it's just about consultants, but I'll, I think it does apply widely to people working uh, in the caring professions in, within the NHS. Um, only 26% felt valued by the hospital, and less so uh, amongst our women workforce, and I, I thought that might be something we might use as a topic of discussion later. So, do mental health services make us feel valued, and how do they do this? Uh, certainly my trust, Central Northwest London, does, I feel, um, overall make you feel valued. And I, when I was reflecting on this, um, late last night, because of course, you know, not good for your well-being to leave your talks until the last minute, but that's what a lot of people do, I felt that being heard and supported, being listened to by people higher up in the trust to make the decisions at a kind of bigger level, uh, was very important. Um, only 35% of consultants felt fulfilled more than half percent of the time. That was a bit depressing. Um, is there something that the fulfilled consultants are doing to make their quality of life better than others? Um, or is it just about personality traits? And that's uh, another, I think, important uh, topic to discuss. And when we say consultants, how, do, how is life now compared to maybe being a new consultant when you're still trying to find uh, what really works for you in terms of your career. And I know quite a few people here today who were speaking earlier may have found their niche uh, later in their careers. Um, what we do know is that self-determination uh, is often linked to uh, well-being and, um, and only 53% of consultants felt they've had enough input into their final job plans, for example flexible working hours, and job shares are more frequent now than ever. And these were viewed by many trusts as a way to improve quality of life. Annualized hours and a sabbatical. Who would love a sabbatical? Yeah, who would feel better to come back after a sabbatical? Every time I meet some American academics, I'm, I just, I'm green with envy of the thought. But there you are, so, so we know what could work. It's about recharging one's batteries. So how do you do that if you actually don't have the time off? Um, a little bit about what leads people to leave their jobs at 60. Um, stress plays a big part. P pressure and lack of control over job plans. No, no big news here, but I thought I would just let you know this. This is a very recent survey and nothing much has changed uh, compared to past surveys. Um, 
about research and teaching, and I'll get on to that. These were things that were valued, that somehow made a difference. They allow you to feel that you can, I, I think, they allow you to feel that you can do some good, that you can transmit what you have loved and been passionate about. Um, and this is my favourite slide, to have been seen, to have made a difference. Um, put your hand up if you believe that that plays a part in the way you work and the way you relate to others. You know, the whole room. If you, if you haven't put your hand up, I'd be interested to know what drives you instead. But that's, that's it really. So I'd just like to say um, that in my 11 minutes, I have now given you the bit that um, uh, pertains to facts. Um, what I'd like to do next, next is really just to give you a very brief overview of what um, I have found in my career to work well for me because, as I said, if I'd had this talk when I was, you know, 25, it might have speeded up some of the good things that I do now. Um, I knew that I wanted to be a psychiatrist before I really knew what a psychiatrist was, um, but I liked the idea of sitting in this little booth and, um, you know, uh, talking to people as they came up and asked me to sort their troubles out. And, and so, although Lucy turned out to be rather an unpleasant uh, young girl, um, I didn't know this. I was too young to work, work it out. I just liked the booth. Um, so it was quite funny that eventually it did actually happen. Um, so, as you can tell from my accent, I'm a half Italian, but I was born there, grew up there, lived there for much of my life. Um, mainly in Milan, where I had a pretty um, lovely kind of Dolce Vita life, um, uh, on the back of mopeds by the age of 11, which alarmed my parents greatly, especially because no safety helmets were available at the time. Um, but, um, but very soon, I think by the time I was 12 or 13, um, uh, heroin had reached an epidemic proportion uh, all over my country, but very much in my city. Um, I had already been going to primary school on my own um, or accompanying my younger siblings, walking over um, heroin addicts, literally climbing over them, watching them inject, literally watching them inject, and playing in playgrounds in the park where syringes filled with blood had to be put on the side so we could play football. And this is no dramatization, this is life as it was. Um, so I feel that, um, I'm telling you this because I've chosen a life uh, treating people with addictions because I've lost many friends to addiction, whether it's a consequence of alcohol abuse or whether it's death from heroin overdose or whether it's a life relegated to rehabs forever and ever, people who had a shining future ahead. Um, and I gave a TED, TED talk about that, if anyone wants to look at that. Anyway, so my university was lovely and I enjoyed it greatly, uh, but during a summer, a fateful summer, a good fateful summer, I ended up in London doing a locum and my life changed because I met my husband um, in the junior doctor's office of a psychiatric hospital. Um, the, <laughs> the Derek, well, I'm okay, I can just chat for another 10, 10 minutes, yeah? Um, so, the, so this is the interesting thing, right? My, everything nearly went terribly pear-shaped for me because being Italian and being very sociable and outgoing and a bit more relaxed than most of my British colleagues in the junior doctor's office, when they said to me, time for your interview, it's your time to be, do you want to be a senior house officer, as we were then called? And I was like, yeah, I've been doing this job for four months, I can do it, I'd love to do it. I went for the interview with a famous Dr. Bridget, who was very old school, Oxford and all of that, and he sat me down and said, right, why is it that you want to work in this hospital, in this unit? And I looked at him in the eyes and I said, Dr. Bridget, I just love the architecture of this hospital. <laughs> So his demeanor changed rapidly, and it was only, you know, <laughs> it was only by the uh, seat of my pants that I managed to save myself, suddenly realizing that I was being too relaxed, this wasn't funny, this was a serious interview to get a serious... 
So I uh, said, but of course, it's this and this and this, and I changed. So my first advice to anyone quite junior is don't underestimate your familiarity with people when it comes to important meetings. Um, the training years were very, very uh, daunting, actually, coming from abroad, uh, being the only Italian. Though I actually a flexible trainee who was from Italy, but there was no one serious, if you see what I mean, full-time. They were all guys, they were all British, and they were all very high-flying. So it was a time when, you know, if you weren't full-time, you were not counted. Um, and uh, it was very acute on the wards. People were very sick. We did long calls, suicidal patients, distressed families, the lot. And um, as the years went on, of course, I then had to balance the children, etc., staying full time. Um, and I kind of, and there was no social media and no research, and so no social media. No, I didn't really have proper sort of role models at all. So I'm glad now through social media and the work people like Derek are doing, we are the WF are doing, we can provide you with these role models and that's great. Um, particularly I wasn't deemed to be worth anything in relation to research. Um, no, no one ever talked to me about research and no one ever mentioned it. And when I started kicking up a fuss saying, well why are all you guys doing research and not me? Um, uh, someone showed up and dumped, I was pregnant by then, very pregnant. They dumped a box of uh, suicide notes from people who had killed themselves on the London Underground uh, rails and said, here you are, on your maternity leave, uh, you can look at these. Um, and I was like, yeah, I can, I can finally be a researcher, people will take me seriously. So I took them home and I was crying and crying. There were people saying goodbye to their babies, to their children, to their wives. And there I was about to give birth and I thought, oh my God, I'm no good. I can't do research. I have to give the box back. And it was only a bit later that I realized that actually it wasn't my fault. It was the suicide notes that didn't go with pregnancy and emotional uh, lability. So I... Uh, so what I did instead was I actually uh, geared myself up, and again, it would have been great to have a network then, and I didn't have it, and I actually worked crazy hours, and I swatted up, and I won um, an Imperial College a full-time research award, uh, beating some of the people in my office who didn't get it, um, which then led to an MD in neuroscience. And I think that's my other point. Um, find your niche. The ventral medial prefrontal cortex, for me, is one of the best words in the world. You know, I can talk for hours about it at dinner parties until my husband kicks me under the table. Um, there is a network of people globally, so find your niche, whatever it is, and you will be very happy if you're feeling that you're struggling and that work is too intense, as certainly sometimes it has felt. That's just a picture of a brain I took to celebrate the fact that I was so happy. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, um, so consultant years, I've nearly finished, nearly finished. Um, consultant years, uh, I, I worked at uh, Needle Exchange, I don't know if you know what that is, but that's pretty tough work, frontline, you know, people came in, you gave them needles, they injected themselves, they gave back the needles. Uh, then I worked with the homeless people in central London. It was all quite grim, but I loved every minute of it. Um, but then, you see, the thing was, I had a light bulb moment. Uh, because part of my research had looked at the impulsivity in certain patients and I realized that this issue of gambling was absolutely what I needed to dedicate my career to. So I did and 10 years ago I set up the first and only NHS clinic um, and only two months ago Jeremy Hunt came along he opened the whole thing, you know, celebrating, and he listened to me speak. Little did I know that two days later, literally two days later, he'd be going. He didn't listen to a word I said. He was thinking about foreign policy. But at the time, it felt great and validating for me, anyway, and my trust. Um, so that's good. Do something new, do something special, and then celebrate the fact you can keep it running, if you can. Because at times, it's been very difficult. Um, so, yeah, that's a tapestry I did during my maternity leave because I was missing work, so I tapestried a brain. <laughs> um, publish books. Don't let anyone tell you you can't be an author. Publish books. What interests you? Okay, do it. Get a group of people. I've done two, well, more than two, but these two are on here. 
They've been wonderful, exciting. The problem gambling women has been amazing. Um, join a charity. You know, I did 10 years as a trustee of Sporting Chance Charity. That filled my days with real pleasure when work was difficult, when, you know, work was stressful. Join a federation. We're at the back there. Come and, come and support the organization. Um, give kindness. I was thinking, what can I tell you? Give kindness. Be nice to people, to your juniors, really. It gives me so much pleasure, and I am old, older, to, to give kindness. And show gratitude. Um, that's given me more pleasure at work in recent years than anything else. Someone does something good for you. By the way, this is for someone special, and they haven't received it yet. It's in an envelope about to be handed over next week. Um, someone who's done a lot for my clinic, and I will never forget that. Uh, take up a sport. That's my group. I could never run. I couldn't run. Any, you know, I never did anything that won me any medal at school ever, particularly not in sport. Um, but I've joined a running team and run a marathon, and actually more than one now, and I love it. So you can set your mind to things and do them. Teach, because that's really important. It will make you feel that what you're doing is not just for yourself, but it's for others. Like the books and like the research. And. Um, yeah, do something special, something unusual. This scarf, I got my brother-in-law to design it for the Medical Women's Federation. When I had the idea, people were like, what? You want to do what? There's a guy in Italy who's going to design a scarf. We sold out. We sold out in one day. So it's there. There are none left. Um, so dive right in, and this is me, actually, taken by my daughter, because like, we just realized a jacket made you disappear. So anyway, um, it's a running jacket. And don't take yourself too seriously. So write to me if you want any advice. Thank you.